Good morning. Welcome to worship. Today is the second Sunday after Pentecost. This is the first Sunday in the green season of the church year. Today's lessons focus on the work of redemption through the ministry of the apostles and our call to be his servants and work for his kingdom. Thankfully, we are now able to be open for worship at St. John's. Our worship services are Sunday at 10 a.m. or Wednesday at 7. You are welcome to physically join us. Or if you're not able to physically join us, we will continue to offer services through Kojiko Your TV. We begin our worship now with the brief order for confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We begin with our opening hymn.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty, eternal God, in the word of your apostles and prophets, you have proclaimed to us your saving will. Grant us faith to believe your promises that we may receive eternal salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. At this time, Rosie will sing thy word. Testament reading for the second Sunday after Pentecost is from Exodus chapter 19. The people of Israel set out from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord God called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak 
to the people of Israel. So Moses came down and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for this Sunday is Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle is from Romans chapter 5. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the ninth and tenth chapters. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, 
but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The name of the twelve apostles were these, first Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go now nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without pay. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now confess our saving faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we sing the hymn of the day, You Have Come Down to the Lake Shore, hymn 784, in with one voice.
Grace, peace, and mercy from God the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The sermon text is from the Gospel reading for this day. Jesus said, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Here ends the text. If you were to take a poll asking the question, which of Jesus' apostles was the least likely man to be chosen by the Lord, Matthew would probably get the most votes. Oh yeah, I'm sure that Simon the Zealot would get some votes. After all, he was part of an extreme group who sought to expel the Romans by terrorist activities. But at least he was a devout Jew, and although misled, he was determined to see the people of God flourish. Judas Iscariot may have also received some votes for the least likely to be chosen apostle. We know how his life ended up in betrayal. However, at the start, I'm sure there were not many indicators of his rebellious tendencies. But Matthew, Matthew, on the other hand, was a despised tax collector. My wife and I are presently watching the television series called The Chosen. I recommend it. It's uh, fairly biblically accurate, and it's a good portrayal of the life of Christ and of his apostles. The character of Matthew is very interesting. The production helps the viewer see and experience just how despised tax collectors were at that time. Matthew, in this series, The Chosen, is portrayed as having to travel undercover, being fearful of assault. He is alone, friendless, hated and rejected by all, even his own family would not welcome him. William Barclay has described Matthew 
as the man whom all men despised. To be a tax collector at that time was about as despicable as being a drug dealer today. It required a man not to care about people or morals or values or ethics, but to only be concerned about money and about self. For Jesus to call Matthew as one of his workers and a disciple was an odd and even shocking choice. It would be like uh, electing a gangster to be the president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Cicero wrote in 146 BC, of all the most disgusting trades, tax collector got his vote as the most terrible of all. Matthew was called Levi before Jesus encountered him. It seems that Jesus is the one who gave him the name Matthew, just as Jesus gave Simon the name Peter. Perhaps the name change was symbolic of the, the new start that Jesus would provide for him. Matthew's name means gift of God. The name is appropriate, for Matthew actually did receive a gift from God. The gift was Jesus, the greatest gift that Matthew could ever receive. Matthew was sitting at his fortified tax booth near the shore in the city of Capernaum. He had heard Jesus preach, and something stirred within him. Most likely, for the first time in his life, he saw that there was more to living than accumulating massive amounts of money. He encountered somebody who for the very first time didn't despise him, didn't look him upon him as being evil. He witnessed someone who saw him not just as a thief. It's interesting and significant that Scripture records that little detail Jesus went through the village and saw Matthew. He noticed Matthew. He saw the agony and stress on his face. He was one of the ones who was helpless and harassed, like a sheep without a shepherd. The first step in Matthew's transformation came when Jesus confronts him. Jesus initiates the relationship with him. And it was, first of all, a relationship of acceptance. And then Jesus said to him, follow me. Luke's gospel records Matthew left all and followed Jesus. You know, when it states that Matthew left all, he did leave behind an awful lot of material things. He left behind more treasure than any of the other apostles left behind. He certainly left behind a lucrative custom contract. That financial sacrifice by Matthew was very large. But as well as leaving his wealth behind, Matthew also left some other things behind. Matthew left his sin behind. He left his selfishness. He left his alienation of people behind. He left behind his corruption, his embezzlement, his stealing. He left all of that behind as Jesus forgave him of all of it. And he set off on a new course. However, Matthew did bring some things with him. Matthew brought with him his pen and writing materials. And that, friends, is very significant. Matthew wrote the first of the Gospels. He wrote it in Hebrew. The other Gospel writers wrote in Greek. 
Matthew wrote with concern for his fellow Jew. Oftentimes, Matthew tied the prophecies of the Old Testament to the work and the ministry of Jesus. You know, Augustine had as a symbol for Matthew a lion. And it comes from the description of Jesus as the Lion of Judah, which is a significant image, for that's what Matthew was all about, proclaiming the Lion of Judah, the Messiah, Jesus. Matthew, the once despised enemy of the people, becomes the beloved Matthew, friend of Jesus, apostle, servant of God, redeemed by the Lord, and a faithful witness to the very end. According to tradition, and to John Fox's book, The Book of Martyrs, Matthew was killed in the very place he was called to serve and witness, Ethiopia. It is believed that he was murdered by the king of Ethiopia while he was worshiping his Lord at the altar. And in many ways, that's so appropriate that such a man of God would give his life worshiping the Savior. Matthew, the unlikely disciple, is one of the disciples that we perhaps can most closely relate to. You know, when we think about our personal lives, we, we oftentimes conclude, well, we deserve to be voted in as the one most unlikely to be called by Christ, to follow him, to serve him. But most remarkably, Jesus Christ calls you. You are called into relationship with the Lord. That call into the adventure of faith begins at baptism. In baptism, God names you as his very own. God empowers you to be his child. God brings you into relationship with him. But more, he continually calls you by the gospel. St. Paul states to the Christians in Thessalonica, he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, whenever you hear the gospel, that is the good news of Jesus Christ, you are being called. You are being called to receive those very gifts and to respond to those gifts with faith and with a life of faithful service. As you are hearing this message right now, perhaps in your living room, you are being called by the gospel, to receive Christ's grace, his forgiveness, his mercy. St. Paul wrote to the church of God that's in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. And he continues, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ. Isn't that marvelous? We are called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. Well, what does that call by our Lord mean for you? Well, like Matthew, it means being called into a new way of living. Scripture is filled with passages relating the changes that come from being called by God. In Galatians 5, verse 13, God has called you to freedom. Ephesians 1.18, God has called you to hope. Hebrews 11.8, God has called you to obedience. Galatians 5.13, God has called you to serve. 1 Timothy 6.12, God has called you to spend eternity with him. You know, Luther talked about the, the twofold call of a Christian. We are called to faith and call to a life that flows from faith. In general, Peter said, God has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And in this call by Jesus, 
we leave certain things behind. We certainly leave behind a, a life that's dedicated to sin. For the Lord redeems us. He forgives us. He erases all of our past iniquities. In this regard, we are changed. We are transformed. You know, Augustine, the great church father, lived a, a life before his conversion of immorality. And after he was converted, one day he was accosted by one of his former mistresses. When he saw her, he turned and started walking away the other way. And she called out to him. She said, Augustine, it is I. And Augustine kept moving. And he said, yes, but it is not I. Jesus calls us to a new life, to leave our sin behind us. But like Matthew, we are to bring some things with us. We are to bring with us our abilities, our unique gifts. We are to employ those gifts to accomplish His work, His will. The Apostle Paul said there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are a variety of service, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in every one. What are we to do to serve our Lord? Well, Jesus said in the Gospel, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. At the present time in Canada, we are seeing this very thing being played out. The CBC had a report last month relating the fact that Canadian farmers are struggling with huge labor shortages due to COVID-19. Normally, Canadian farmers employ 60,000 temporary foreign workers. But with the borders being closed and the fear of spreading the coronavirus, many farmers are finding themselves without workers. The article reported this may mean higher food prices. So quite literally, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. But spiritually... Spiritually, that is true as well. Right now, the harvest of souls for Christ is plentiful. More so with this worldwide pandemic. Many people are frightened, confused, like sheep without a shepherd. They are harassed and helpless. And numerous people are asking critical life and death questions. Asking themselves, where they will spend eternity. The harvest is plentiful. People are ripe to hear the good news of Jesus, to hear the good news of His forgiving grace. But the laborers are few. People are hesitant to share their faith. But perhaps we make it far more complicated than we ever need to. The ministry of Jesus really is our example. Jesus saw people in need. He had compassion on them. He invited them to gather together into community. And finally, he sent others out until all have heard and come to believe in his name and gather together under his grace. And that's basically what he's calling us to do. To see others in their need. To open our eyes to people's needs. To have compassion on people. To invite to gather together. To encourage people to share the message until all are invited to participate in that life-changing and life-giving relationship with our God. Jesus does not call the apostles that we would have voted for or expected. Matthew, the tax collector, certainly falls into that category. But so do you and I. Amen. We pray. Lord, we thank you for the saints of old, 
who clearly confess their faith in you through the writing of the sacred scriptures, especially Matthew. May we continue to proclaim and live out these truths from your word as those before us have done. May their writings and living be testimonies to us as we continue to joyfully celebrate our faith in you. Amen. At this time, Margaret will now sing. For the church and her witness of hope to the world, that in every city, village, and home across the globe, the voice of the Lord may be heard by the faithful preaching of the gospel. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor in the fields of the Lord today, and for the Lord to raise up laborers for his harvest fields, that their work may be blessed and they may be protected and defended against the enemies of the kingdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our synod, and Matthew, our synod president, for our congregation, and for the resources to accomplish what the Lord has given us to do, despite all obstacles and temptations, that united in the faith we may serve the Lord with joy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who live in Canada, for those who govern in this country, and for the cause of peace and justice, that we may all be given grace and freedom to serve the Lord honorably and in accord with his word. Where there is strife in the world, we ask that you would bring healing, especially with the racial tensions in the United States. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
for the poor and hungry, the homeless and unemployed, and the oppressed, that the Lord would grant them mercy, and that we may help to relieve their suffering and want. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick, that the Lord would grant them healing. For the wounded in spirit, that the Lord would make them whole. For the grieving, that the Lord would comfort them, especially all afflicted by the ongoing pandemic and its effects. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who know the riches of the Lord's blessings, that they may cheerfully return to the Lord the tithes and offerings of a grateful heart and give generously to the many agencies of the church working to help those in need. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the dying, that they may have peace at the last. And for our grateful remembrance of all those who have died in Christ, that in the fullness of time, the Lord may bring us with them into his everlasting presence, where sin and death will trouble us no more. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. O blessed Lord, through Moses you called the people to yourself, and from them you delivered up your own Son to be our Savior. By his suffering and death, he has redeemed us sinners from our sins, and by his resurrection, he has released us from the fear of death. Help us to live as your own people, doing the good works for which we were created, and praying with confidence the petitions and supplications of our hearts through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, name. thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done, done on earth, earth as it as is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, bread and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we, we forgive, forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We now sing our final hymn.